Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Dittbrenner. I'm here on behalf of Palisades Village and the Events Committee. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker today, uh, Lynn Nicholas, an old friend, talking about her book, The Rape of Europa, The Fate of Europe's Treasures in the Third Reich and the Second World War. It's her prize-winning history of the Nazi looting of European paintings, sculpture, and other treasures during the World War II era, and what happened to specific collections and even to specific paintings. As a result of Wynn's detective work, the magnitude of the Nazi acquisition program is no longer a secret. And the book had a powerful stimulus and impact on international efforts for recovery, restoration, and restitution of artworks. It also got Lynn deeply engaged in those international and national efforts. She has lectured wildly, widely here and abroad and was decorated by the French government with the Légion d'honneur and by the Polish government with the Amicus Polier uh, medal. The backdrop for the book was decades of her interest and education focusing on international affairs and art history at Radcliffe, Oxford, Madrid, work at the National Gallery, then Brussels in the late 70s when her husband Robin took a NATO position. It was there we met Robin, her family, and when she was just beginning her research. Her research and writing took more than 10 years to complete. Mind you, she was raising a family with three children at the same time. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished guest speaker and my longtime friend, Lynn Nicholas. Well, uh, thank you very much, Job. And can, can everyone hear me just to be sure that I'm coming through? Yes? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we can. Uh, first, I, I would very much like to thank the <clears throat> Palisades community and, and my dear friend, Job Ditferner, for asking me to speak today. And um, it was, it's wonderful fun. I've been sort of semi-retired, as many of us probably are. And so this is um, a, a, a good kind of a revival. Um, the... the uh, the title of this talk um, should maybe be Love of Art, um, because the displacement and recovery of works of art in World War II certainly shows plenty of that. There was no greater lover of art than Adolf Hitler, but the only trouble was that the art Hitler liked mostly belonged to other people. And his desire to possess, clean, cleanse, and arrange Europe's peoples and patrimony to his own liking would cause almost every work of art in Europe, whether it was private or state or in storage, um, it would, all of these works of art would, would be put away in refuges, stolen, sold, or hidden, uh, whether they were private or state collections. And the euphemism that art historians use for that is that art has been displaced. So whenever you see that word, it means all kinds of things could have happened. Uh, this, this take of, of Hitler's and of the Nazis included um, paintings, millions of books, statues like the ones on this screen right here, tons of furniture, crates of plates and trunks of silver. It's, it's truly a miracle that any of these fragile things survived. Uh, the Mona Lisa, for instance, oops, oh, so it's not advancing. The Mona Lisa, for instance, uh, was moved several times in the midst of battle on, uh, in trucks driven by the female uh, museum staff from the Louvre. Um, and most of them didn't really have driver's licenses, but um, <clears throat> the men had all been drafted, so there was no one else to do it. And that sort of thing happened in every threatened country. Soviet curators who uh, um, accompanied the Hermitage uh, items. The Hermitage is huge, and this is one gallery before it was evacuated, and this is the gallery during the siege of Leningrad when snow and ice and everything came into the gallery, <clears throat> but all the paintings had been taken to Siberia. And when these, when they, the curators and everything, they fled in the middle of summer, as you remember, the 
the attack on uh, <clears throat> Russia was very unexpected and they just had their summer clothes. So they were all very cold for quite a long time until they could get more things sent from, from uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. As it became clearer to the art community in Western Europe that Hitler was headed toward war, major preparations began. Um, if this was the first war in which bombing would be a big problem. And so uh, in, in the Spanish Civil War, they, they evacuated all the um, paintings from the Prado to Switzerland and uh, the museum itself was bombed. And so everyone knew that this was a necessary thing. So during the next year, during the phony war, uh, or even after the war started in the case of Poland, Polish curators shipped hundreds of tapestries like this fabulous one down the Vistula from uh, Warsaw and Krakow. And these, these tapestries went on to Rome and eventually to Canada, but that's a long story. So if I have time, I can tell you more. And uh, the, the Venetian collections went uh, to storage um, on barges. And you kind of wonder if this was really a good idea or not, but anyway, that's the, what happened. And uh, the, um, the night watch in, in uh, I don't know if I showed you that picture before, the night watch, the famous night watch um, was rolled up on a, you can see it there, the central figure, and it went to storage looking like this. And at the Louvre, most of the pictures were taken out of their frames um, and packed in special boxes and sent off to uh, various refuges. After Pearl Harbor, of course, the American museums also would send their best things to uh, shelters. One is there's the wonderful minutes of the meetings that all the directors had. And one, one of them wondered actually if anybody would really notice that things had been taken off the walls and places like the National Gallery. But anyway, they, they did do it. And there was a little bit of hysteria at first. The Museum of Modern Art took things down every night and rehung them in the morning, which soon became impractical. Um, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston <clears throat> posted Minutemen on the roof and sealed off its Japanese galleries uh, for fear of terrorists. Um, and a, a, oh, a, there was a congressman in Washington who, who wondered if uh, uh, the, uh, all the white buildings in, the United, in Washington should be um, painted in camo so that they would be less obvious bomb targets, um, but, um, or whether the roof of the National Gallery of Art should be used as a bomb emplacement. But luckily, calm prevailed and the uh, National Gallery's 75 best paintings shown here in moving vans um, <clears throat> went to Biltmore in, in the Carolinas and the Met set its things to the wilds of suburban uh, California, uh, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, but no me American museum closed because they all thought that it was important to support public morale. Uh, it was more than 40 years ago who can I really can hardly believe that on a dark and stormy afternoon in Brussels, which was like most storm, most afternoons in Brussels were dark and stormy. Um, when we were living there at the time, along with the Ditburners, and I came across the obituary of Rose Vallon, who had been a sort of lowly curator at the Louvre, who uh, and it said in the article, would not was not only a resistance heroine, but had, after the war, worked directly to recover some 60,000 works of art looted from France, which is a whole lot of art. And despite the fact that I'd worked in museums off and on for many years, I'd, I'd really never thought about what had happened to work, works of art in World War II. And so reading her obituary inspired me to find out. And I was also amazed at the number. I mean, the National Gallery of Art has maybe three or 4,000 things, I mean, paintings now. Um, <clears throat> but so 60,000 works of art is something that gets an art historian's attention. So as soon as I began to do research on the subject, I began to hear about the allied art specialists who are now called Monuments Men, who, um, uh, here are a few of them, uh, who were recently featured in a movie by with George Clooney in it. Um, 
uh, uh, and the fact, whoops, I don't know why it's doing this now. Anyway, the fact that there were monuments men at all in the, um, uh, in, the <clears throat> in our army was, um, was something of a miracle that the, the British commands and the North African command had been very reluctant to uh, add frills like that. Uh, feeling that the existing land rules of land warfare would enough protection for works of art and um, that things would kind of take care of themselves and that they would kind of muddle through. But the American Museum establishment led by the, the board of the National Gallery of Art, which I love this picture, this is they look like a really tough bunch and they, they were actually for art, you know, art people. Um, but they had been able to stay in contact with the European colleagues. And um, after months of lobbying uh, President Roosevelt and the Congress and the army, which was just as hard to do that combination as it is now, they were persuaded that knowledgeable officers were needed not only to protect ancient monuments from graffiti minded soldiers, um, but to, uh, this, is, this is in Libya, this is what the, uh, had happened British soldiers or Italian soldiers uh, in Libya, but not only to protect monuments like this, uh, but to trace the vast number of objects that were known to, to be, have been stolen and were being looted at the same time. So luckily for me, when I began work on this subject, uh, I, um, I, ran, I, I found that I actually knew quite a lot of these uh, monuments men and that they were alive and well, and we're still working in, in, in museums. This is Edith Standen, a monuments woman who was uh, the curator of tapestries at the Metropolitan Museum. And after the war, they had just gone back to their jobs and put the records and photographs of their wartime experiences in bottom drawers and gotten on with life. And all, some of them, although some of them had written memoirs um, early on, no one had asked them for a long time about what they'd done, which they didn't really think was particularly heroic, which I think was true. Many people who served in World War II, they came back and, and really nobody really liked to talk about it a lot. I know my father was a submarine in the Pacific and he never ever told us any stories or anything. So we had to find out by other means. Uh, and the experiences of these men and women were, in fact, amazing and heroic. Two of them were killed in action. Um, and, another, and another one, uh, Walker Hancock, who became a, a famous sculptor, is shown here um, rescuing a, a, a little Madonna from a, a church in, in Belgium during the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, so they did really extraordinary things. And they found the most glorious works of, of civilization, like the Ghent altarpiece, uh, in mines and cow sheds and dungeons and garages all over the place. So it's really hard to imagine what it must have, I mean, it was very exciting for them. And it's hard to imagine how extraordinary it must have been to open a barn door and see something like this Botticelli's Primavera in a room that was being used by uh, British troops as a latrine. I mean, unbelievable. So, but it wasn't until they, got to Paris in, uh, after the battle of, uh, in 1944, that the monuments men would begin with the help of people like Rose Vallon, the lady I showed you before, to understand the true methodology uh, and magnitude of Nazi looting. And down at the bottom, you see the, the guy on the right is um, uh, James Rorimer, who eventually became director of the Museum of uh, Metropolitan Museum. And he's looking at the place La Joconde is the French name for the Mona Lisa where she would have been hanging had she not been taken away in the trucks driven by the ladies. Uh, the Nazis had um, four major well-funded bureaucracies that concerned themselves exclusively with art matters and they were supported by the full force of uh, Nazi military and police organizations. Here we see um, Hitler and Goering looking at a, an actually a German painting um, that they wanted to have and you know, move around to wherever they wanted it. Um, <clears throat> uh, Hitler had, Hitler's agency was supposed to uh, 
gather materials for a huge museum he was going to build in Linz, which was his hometown in Austria. And it was going to be a, a mega museum with, with every with books and coins and paintings and everything. And while Goering, um, who also amassed several thousand uh, works, spent was was really less interested in, in a state museum than in his own personal houses. He had eight houses. Um, and he um, moved things all around to them. Even the SS was into art. Um, that there's Goering. At, I love that picture of him. Uh, and, um, and even the SS shown here was into archaeology, a, a field which they dominated uh, entirely in Germany during the Nazi era because uh, their idea was to prove that um, Germanic peoples had been superior to all others um, from prehistoric times on. And uh, Alfred Rosenberg, no relation to, you know, not Jewish, no relation to Paul Ro Rosenberg, the famous dealer, was the kind of intellectual guru of the, uh, of the Nazi party. And um, he, uh, he, he collected mostly at the beginning Jewish books for a planned anti-Semitic think tank that they were going to set up. So they didn't destroy the books, they saved them. And there were lots and lots of them. Here's a few shelves of them um, <clears throat> that were recovered after the war uh, by the allies. Um, and by the war's end, these groups and their many subsidiaries, and it was very in to, for everybody in, in Nazi officialdom to collect art and, or steal it. Um, they had a and the art market, they also bought tons of stuff. So the art market had a, a huge um, boom during the, during the war, uh, but they would have literally accumulated millions and millions of objects of every kind down to even church bells. These are, I think, uh, mostly from France and they were gonna be melted down to make um, you know, uh, shells for tanks and things like that. Um, but the reshuffling of works had actually begun in Germany itself long before the war. And Germany was, was to be purged of so-called degenerate work and the artists that were responsible for them. So Hitler had no doubts about what was, was not acceptable. I mean, he did not like uh, anything that was unfinished or abstract like this Kandinsky um, or, uh, these horses by Mark, Franz Mark, never mind that this, the artists had died fighting for Germany in World War I. I mean, that, that did, was no help at all. And someone like George Gross was out because he satirized the, the Prussian military class and that you can see what, why they thought that. And someone like Kata Kolbitz, who was very, very German because she was anti-war. And then this poster says, no more of war. And it uh, <clears throat> was not surprising because she lost her son in World War I and then she would lose another relative in World War II. So, uh, but she, she was not allowed to exhibit all during the war uh, or, or during the Nazi era, mostly early, later parts of the Nazi era. Um, it took Hitler's own colleagues quite a while to figure out what the rules were. Uh, Goebbels, for instance, who had decorated his dining room with, uh, paintings by Emil Nolde, who was a, actually a good, a loyal Nazi party member, um, uh, had to take them all down because Hitler came to dinner and didn't like them. They were too abstract for him. And um, so uh, that was, Nolde was also then banished to a remote seacoast town um, where he did keep painting, but he painted tiny postcards, which like Emily Dickinson, and uh, he, he hid them behind the wallpaper because the Gestapo and people would come in and, and to these artists' studios and expect, inspect their, uh, feel their brushes to see if they'd been painting and they, weren't, they were not technically allowed to paint uh, if they were considered anti-Nazi. The pressure on the German museums to get rid of bad art was really tremendous. Um, and so by 1937, when they, uh, by 1937, they hadn't finished, uh, of course, they, not, art museums never want to give up anything. Um, Hitler went, sent committees of Nazi artists and theorists right into the galleries who decided as they walked through what had to go. 
And this was very hard work because not only because they had to, uh, <clears throat> you know, they were hidden, but because agonizing decisions had to be made. For instance, this was a, a, a painting by Lovis Corinth. And although the landscape is considered okay, the sky was considered degenerate. And so that, that painting uh, was taken away. And, and in the end, uh, about 16,000 works owned by the German state were removed from their museums. And to make sure everybody got the message, they were, uh, they were shown in degenerate art exhibitions. Here you can see some you know, things hung on the wall with rude, rude remarks about all the artists and uh, <clears throat> very nasty stuff. Uh, and this is Hitler and Goebbels at the at one of the op the big opening of the biggest one, which was in Munich. Um, and just so you know what kind of thing was acceptable, this is called a peasant Venus. Um, this Hitler thought this was great, and um, a lot of people admire her socks. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that was typical of what was accepted by the Nazis, and they they collected them all and then they tried to sell them, but there, there were few buyers for obvious reasons. And so um, some of them have actually ended up uh, in, in our storage areas, a storage stored by the army, which recovered them, but I think they've all gone back. So but while the Nazis found these things unacceptable for the home folks, they were not so pure as to ignore their value. And so soon there was a thriving trade in uh, in works that were banished from Germany, <clears throat> which was especially beneficial to the new uh, and growing collections of modern art in the United States and other places. A special marketing organization was set up uh, where you hear there's a Van Gogh self-portrait and a, um, you know there, there were just terrific things, but this was the place where you could come and you could look and buy things or be sent photographs, but you could only buy them for foreign exchange, uh, so you could get a, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a Van Gogh or something for a couple of dollars, um, or a Swiss francs. Swiss francs were okay too. And one of the dealers who has now become very well known, who marketed these things, was Hildebrand Gorlet. But you know, it, it, he's supposed to be an evil person who possessed the loot, looted art, but actually he was part Jewish, Jewish, and so. Uh, had he not obeyed, he would have been, um, one, one dreads to think what would have happened to him. But he did manage to salt away a few of these degenerate things for himself. Um, and these, they were found a couple of years ago in, a, in an uh, extraordinary collection in Munich owned by his son. Um, but, and to Pete, in the end, the, because the sales weren't going fast enough, the Nazi government put on an auction in 1939 where um, there's the same Van Gogh again, um, where, I mean, this was a, a very, uh, very popular auction. And um, Joseph Pulitzer, for instance, was there and bought this nice Matisse. Um, and so they were very high level works of art. Um, but most of the leftovers of th this operation were uh, eventually burned in an, op, in, a, in an exercise by the Berlin Fire Department because they were not considered worthy of being owned by Germans and staying in Germany. <clears throat> uh, along with the uh, purging of degenerate art in Germany went the purging of what the Nazis considered degenerate or alien races. And the first idea was to force, force such people, uh, mainly Jews, uh, to leave Germany. But before they left, they would often be forced to sell most of their assets, often at government controlled auctions. And open confiscations like this Rothschild piece, this furniture, this piece of furniture from the Rothschild Palace in Austria didn't really begin until 1938 when at the Anschluss, when the Germans took over, the Nazis took over Austria and uh, in the extreme looting the following year uh, on Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass. Um, in 1939, Hitler invaded Poland and started to impose Nazi ideology there. And the Nazis considered the Slavs to be an alien race as like the Jews and um, uh, 
their long-term policy for Eastern Europe included, I'm gonna go back to this one. Their long-term policy for Eastern Europe included the total elimination of Slavic peoples and their culture. So that you see here, they took um, in this picture, these are American officers recovering this stuff, but it was things from Pol the Polish churches were all, the Catholic churches were all stripped bare because Poles were Slavs and therefore unworthy of owning these things. But anything that was um, created by a German, like the Wittstoss altarpiece in Krakow, which is truly magnificent, um, would be preserved and taken back to Germany, which happened. They took it all apart and took it back to Germany in, in special train cars. Of course, not, uh, things that were non-Slavic that were high quality, like this Leonardo da Vinci from the Czartoryski collection in Krakow would be, um, taken as well because they were too good for the Slavs. <clears throat> These policies were even more forcefully carried out eventually in the Soviet Union, where, for example, they dismantled the Amber Room in one of the palaces outside of St. Petersburg, and that, that has never actually been found. But since, the, you know, the Amber is the, I don't know if you've ever seen it, they've restored it now completely, but it's made, it's like, um, uh, stained glass, they're little bits of, of amber. And so probably what is what happened was that it's at the bottom of the Baltic Sea in little bits uh, as, when the, as the Nazis were trying to ship it out when their things were stopped going very well in, in Russia. Uh, after Poland, it was the turn of the Western countries to be occupied. And here the policy was very different. Um, these countries were supposed to be annexed uh, and one way or another to the fatherland. And I've always thought it was, it was amusing that uh, Himmler had picked out Burgundy to be his fiefdom. He was gonna set up a little, I don't know, duchy or something there. And, uh, but their national collections would eventually be totally rearranged to suit Hitler. So, um, and, but in order to maintain calm, uh, only a few things were taken from these countries at once because they, they feared that there might be uprisings on the part of the French and the Dutch and other people. And this sort of rearranging was nothing new actually for Europe. Um, Napoleon had done much the same thing after his conquests. And he, uh, he actually had a, a parade, parade of, of, see, of objects as shown as this print, the camels and the, the horses um, from the Doge's palace in Venice. And you can see all kinds of things, but anyway, he was, and, and the idea was that the French people were more worthy of owning them <clears throat> than, you know, than, than the Italians, I guess, or, or, or they'd actually come from somewhere else before, but I won't go into that. Uh, but at the end of the war, after Napoleon was defeated, um, uh, a, a restitution commission under Lord Wellington was set up. Um, he was the allied commander with, and with quite a lot of, amusing <clears throat> to us now, fussing, <clears throat> Wellington made the French give back most of what they'd taken, but they had managed to hide quite a lot of things, and Hitler was determined to retrieve these things, uh, plus all the items taken from Germany as part of the Versailles Treaty, which was quite a bit, and, and even more on top of that, <clears throat> back, you know, several thousand years. But basically the sheer magnitude of Nazi looting and its genocidal aspects would eclipse any of these previous efforts. Um, the Nazis didn't just target the national collections of conquered countries, they also bought huge amounts in occupied lands. This is from a, a Dutch collection that was auctioned during the war, Rembrandt from the Chabot collection. But the buying was far from normal because the money that the Nazis used was itself stolen from the treasuries of the conquered countries and from people who were persecuted by the Nazis. They paid very good prices and many people rushed to deal with them and offered items which ranged from junk to this top of the line uh, Vermeer, um, which was sold by an Austrian aristocrat. Um, but there was, of course, a very dark side to this trade um, as the vise of the occupation tightened, especially for Jews, uh, survival would become the basis for many a sale. And you could trade a painting uh, 
or a service of some kind for a life. Um, that was the, what happened to the famous scholar Max Friedlander who had fled to Holland, but was in danger of being sent to concentration camps by the Gestapo there. And, but Goering liked him and he liked to have uh, high level expertise uh, for his pictures. So to keep um, Friedlander alive and out of uh, concentration camp, he met, Goering made him an honorary Aryan, um, which is a, a very interesting title. And I've always thought that uh, uh, Friedlander would have must, had a very good time telling Goering that this obviously fake Vermeer painted by the famous uh, artist Van Mecheren was the real thing. And, and it, was, it was Freelander's expertise that got uh, Goering to buy it. Um, the second way that uh, <clears throat> the Nazis got things in Western Europe was by simply confiscating them even, even though if it was a private collection, which was against the rules of warfare uh, from those who didn't fit into their idea of the pure German, German empire. And that included, as I said before, Jews, Poles, Russians, socialists, Freemasons, et cetera, uh, as the same way they'd done at home. And the legal base for these confiscations, which uh, was that the owners had abandoned their property and fled, but that even if they left them in the bank and, and as was the case with this Rem, Rembrandt self-portrait, which was owned by Rothenau, who'd been the foreign minister of, uh, of Germany, um, but it was stored in Holland. Um, and so they, they, since they had fled, they no longer were considered citizens or owners uh, and, and had no rights. And this was really, really so cynical because people who'd been sent to death camps were considered to have fled and their possessions were, uh, you know, fair game. And the take was enormous. This is one, just one room of paintings that they were stored in a little, at the Jeux de Palme Museum in France, uh, you know, but there were thousands of rooms like this or hundreds of rooms. In France, thousands of works were brought into the Jeux de Pont Museum, which is what, what this is. And uh, exhibitions were set up so that the Nazis could choose what they want. Now this, this room was uh, all degenerate art. So the Nazis would not want to take those home and buy uh, to, to Germany, but they did, um, they did uh, as uh, you'll hear later, they did sell them. Um, and Goering did very well. He came quite often to the Jeux de Pomme um, and managed to fill up eight houses, his eight houses with things like this, all bought in other countries um, or confiscated as, the, as what, whichever was the most convenient because he didn't have to worry about the money. The looting eventually included not only valuable works of art, but the entire contents of the victims' houses. Now, this is a you know, very touching picture to my mind of of um, a warehouse full of furniture and kitchenware and everything just down to the, uh, the list that, that, to tell about what's in the, the inventories. They took baby clothes and people's closet, emptied their closets and everything. This was a, something called the M Action, the Furniture Action, Mobile Action. And this was just one warehouse full that they had managed to, they did not manage to remove from Paris before the end of the war. But these things were supposed to go back to Germany and help the new uh, people who had been bombed out or help the colonists who they had sent to uh, repopulate the German ethnic colonists that they sent to repopulate Poland and the Soviet Union. Um, uh, Allied forces crossed into uh, Germany and invaded Italy in, in, uh, uh, in, in the late 40s. And even after they'd all experienced in Italy and France, um, uh, I'll go back. This is Monte Cassino, which um, was bombed and, and the monuments men you know, tried to um, preserve these things. Uh, this is, uh, after the Normandy invasion, um, one of, this is one of Caen, one of the cities of, of Normandy uh, during, you know, destroyed 
in the battle. And the, the monuments man tried to you know, preserve uh, relics and pieces of all of the monuments that were bombed, but because uh, the engineers, the army engineers like to you know, break this up into rubble and use it to build new highways. So um, that was all very difficult. And they, they in, but in Germany, by the time they got to Germany, they, they moved into in a surreal landscape and what they call skeleton cities, which I think is really quite apropos. Uh, and, and all over the place were, you know, books lying all around so that you, you could just uh, take them if you wanted to. Uh, soldiers were able to pick up uh, priceless things like this in the ruins. This is from the Cathedral of Quedlinburg and an army office, army actually enlisted man just put it in the, in the uh, his his uh, mail put it in the ma army mail and it sent it home and he accumulated quite a lot of things which he kept in a secret collection in Texas for many many years until um, fairly recently, um, but. Uh, there were there were, by the time they got to Germany, there weren't very many buildings left to protect. Um, uh, they didn't know still where all the German collections were um, because they were all hidden in caves and things like that. And so they would come come into a church and it would look like that, and they would have to figure out what that was. I mean, and sometimes they were you know a pharmacist supplies or um, you know brooms or mops and and sometimes they were um, priceless works of art and there were, I mean if you read the monuments men's adventures it was it's just like Indiana Jones but they did manage to uh, to uh, recover tons and tons of uh, works of art I think one of the, the most famous of the of these places they, they found was the salt mine at Alt Ause where Hitler had hidden uh, his collections. Um, it, it was specially fitted up right at the end of the war when Germany was in dire straits, but they did manage to uh, um, uh, spend money on that. And then in, in the Merkers mine where there were works of art were also the entire gold reserves of the German nation that, that there it is. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever seen a picture of the inside of Fort Knox, but that was their Fort Knox. Um, and uh, Goering's, Goering had managed to evacuate his things on, on special trains that he sent to Berchtesgaden. And here's a wonderful picture, I think, of the 82nd Airborne unloading uh, some of Goering's uh, looted art, looted treasures uh, from his special trains. The, the locals had had also looted the trains, but they just took the food and the wine and stuff like that, but uh, not the art. Um, the confiscated French collections went were mostly stored in the in the castle of Neuschwanstein, and um, from where they were sent back from there, uh, and they included things like the Rothschilds jewels collection, and um, and in other places they found you know piles and piles of Torahs and other Jewish uh, Judaica, which the, as I said before, the Nazis were gonna use for a, a uh, think tank, a Jewish think tank, but it did, it did save things. It's quite extraordinary that that worked. Um, the army proudly did its best to secure these things. If you can read that sign, it says, uh, you know, restored mass paintings of the old masters, Rembrandt, Rubens, Van Dyck, Charlemagne, the crown of Charlemagne, the original manuscript of Beethoven, etc. <laughs> so the Golden Arrow Art Museum, but 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 this was really not too satisfactory. So um, after a time, when after Eisenhower, um, whoops, Eisenhower, and this is a great picture: Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton, all looking at the, at the works of art stored in a, in one of the mines. They decided that there should be collecting points, so they took over. Um, the old Nazi buildings in Munich and a few other places, the museum at Wiesbaden and made collecting points. And so everything was taken to those places, which in the end, you know, had uh, collections probably rivaling any in the world. Here's one of the monuments men with the head of Nefertiti from which had come from Berlin. Um, but the, the, in the, the American army was very anxious to be rid of the responsibility of all this art. And our policy was to 
send everything back to the country from which it had been taken. So back the things went, I mean, we didn't want to get involved in um, sort of fights over who owned what, which was turned out to be very wise. Um, so back everything went um, on trains and whatnot. Here's the, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's <clears throat> lady with the ermine going back to Poland uh, with a under heavy guard and, you know, in a military train. I mean, it's really <laughs> a little bit mind boggling. And, that, and then these were the things that coming back to uh, Florence um, in a truck, uh, an American army truck, and it says on the side, the works of art of art, Florentine works of art uh, come back to their place from the Alto Adige where, where they were sent on, but they were on, you know, with the American flag. So it was a great propaganda operation for us because actually it had been the negative propaganda of our bombing at Monte Cassino that had really gotten the monuments men uh, group going in the first place. Um, once these things were home, then, and this is just one room at the collecting point of Munich of paintings that had to be sorted out and, um, uh, um, you know, and they had to find out, you had to do research to find out where they come from, who they belong to, et cetera. So once they were home, special commissions in each country had to figure out just who they belonged to. And this was not always an easy job, um, especially when it came to private collections because people are often very secretive about what they own. Um, and especially as a lot of the people had, had been killed or moved and had moved or fled or so it was, it was a, a difficult operation that went on for many, many years after the, the war. And these things are still the objects of, um, of, uh, of controversy to this day. I mean, there's still lawsuits and claims all the time. The Soviet Union, um, also uh, had found, had specialists and it's, tro it's so-called trophy brigades, that's their equivalent of the monuments men. Uh, and they had found tons of art too, uh, but they had quite different ideas about what to do with it. And so they just took everything back to the Soviet Union uh, and regardless who, of who owned it and uh, distributed it amongst their museums. Uh, in, in, the, uh, in the 50s, um, Thousands of works were uh, like this Durer from, from East Berlin were given back to the Eastern Bloc countries, but not to Western countries because they didn't theoretically believe in private property. So um, this Degas, which was from a private German collection um, remained, was actually, they hid all these things in monasteries around uh, Moscow. And uh, now everyone knows that they're there. They've in fact had exhibitions of them, but they are not giving them back. Uh, they've been actually nationalized by the Russian government. Um, that's a long story, which I will not tell you right now. Um, of course, not everything was, got, was taken back by or found by the official agencies of East and West. Hundreds of works are said to have been stolen. So if you see this Raphael from Krakow anywhere in your attic, or um, um, you should tell the State Department because that one's still missing, as is this rather beautiful Bellini from Berlin. And so the searches go on and on. Uh, the restitution of uh, works of art um, following the war was not easy, nor was it always fair, especially when it came to private collections. So if one's possessions were relatively um, uh, famous, um, like this uh, the Vermeer, uh, the astronomer, which was from the um, Rothschild collection in Paris, uh, and, and it, it had been specially chosen by the Nazi leaders, um, then the recovery was quite straightforward. Uh, but if uh, things that were, um, and then the Nazis had actually cataloged all, all these things and were very proud of the fact that it had belonged to the Rothschild collection, uh, which is an interesting point of view, but, um, but, uh, but the claims making was very difficult work, hard work re requiring tons of paperwork and many bureaucracies of, of different nations. So a lot of people gave up in despair or made settlements that would haunt them later. 
for things that had utterly vanished, the German government did give, and the French government did give some compensation, but it is, now, it is much, much harder now to recover things that were dispersed in the art market and could have gone almost anywhere in the world. The legacy of, of Nazi looting lingers on and, and many uh, objects remain to be, be found, but the miracle is that things like this, this is uh, items from the Florentine collections being shipped by the Nazis up to uh, the Austrian border. Uh, but the miracle is that these things survived at all. Of, you know, just, it was really the most destructive war in history, I think. And this was really not by chance because, and so we, we really owe a tremendous debt to people of all kinds who uh, risked their lives to safeguard the human patrimony. And I think particularly of people like, um, it's one of my favorite pictures, Cesare Fazola, who was the guy in the shades. And this is at the Uffizi, he was the librarian of the Uffizi. And uh, on foot, he went back and forth between the, Brit the I think it was mostly British and, and German lines when they were you know, taking Florence to, um, to plead with people to take care of, of, the, of the items they had in their custody and not, for instance, to use this painting by Michelangelo as a tea table, which is what the British troops were doing. So um, I hope that next time you wander through a museum and, and look at, at the items there are around, uh, you will think of all the adventures that the works of art have had. And um, even though they're very silent, they do have wonderful stories to tell. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lynn. That was just fascinating. I'd like to open it up for questions. We had one question um, about the illustrations in the book. Are they similar to the illustrations that you showed in today's presentation? I oh, yes. Yes, a lot of these are in the book, yes. <laughs> Not as many as I wanted, but uh, you know they they are. Uh, uh, I'm I'm trying to get um, my whole, the whole screen here, but I'm not sure it's working. So uh, anyway, yes. Um, okay, let me. Uh... Um, no, the, 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 the pictures in the book, they're most, I did show most of them, I think probably, and um, they are, um, but there are many, many, there are tons more. I mean, if you go to the, the still pictures division of the, Nat oh, that, that's great. Still pictures division of the National Archives, they have, uh, they have tons of them, but it's interesting that they're, they're they are, they don't tell you the name of the town often, they just tell you that the coordinates on the military maps because the monuments men went along with the military units and, and took they were required to take pictures, um, um, but they you know the the way the army classified them isn't always easy. And one thing that's interesting is that the the army reserves have a new program started a couple of years ago um, to. Um, train reserve officers to be monuments men because of course during World War II everybody was drafted but now we don't have the draft so that there are no art experts nor you know as a matter of course in the uh, in the in the United States Army but this way they they will serve for you know they can be called up and they they get special training I have a question Sure. This Kate. is Kate Perry. I'm also on the board and on the events committee of Palisades Village. But Lynn, I absolutely adore your book and I refuse to loan it to anybody. If they ask, <laughs> I order one and give it to them because I will not give up my copy. But I, I, want, I am a member of the um, Monuments Men, Men and Women's Foundation. And oh, I'm good. fascinated by that current work that they're trying to do, uh, training uh, folks here to go over and also the work that they're doing with Syria and some of some yes. of countries where there's active terrorism destroying amazing pieces. And I was wondering if you might address that just a little bit. 
Well, they do. They, um, uh, I, I didn't have time to go into this, but uh, during World War II, they published, you know, they, they had these little pocket books of listing the, you know, things that you should not bomb and blow up and things like them, the monuments and <clears throat> collections. And so they have done those also for the, in, for the Middle East, for I Iraq. And uh, so the soldiers have these, these little pocket things with pictures of the monuments that should not be, you know, used as a place to store trucks or something or tanks. And, and they have, they've made a big effort, but it's, it's never, I mean, it's so difficult because the archeological sites are just open and the people go in there at night and, uh, or they're, you know, it's very hard to guard them all and dig up stuff. And then they, they slowly filter out, which has been actually going on for years um, through the, the, you know, the, through other countries into the, you know, Western markets, but people are much more aware of it now. So that, and they've gotten much tougher and the American customs has gotten tougher. And so uh, it should, should get better. We have someone asking if you know where in California the pieces from the National Gallery were taken. No, I'm sorry, it was not California. It was, it was North Carolina. It was Asheville, that North or South Carolina. I'm, I'm not sure. Asheville, Biltmore, the house, a big house country house there and uh, the things from the Phillips too went North, out in North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah. Um, and uh, the, as, as uh, you know, the Metropolitan sent things to a, a house, a similar kind of house outside of Phil, on Phil, Philadelphia's main line, which they thought was secure, but of course there's a huge naval base there, <laughs> naval, but anyway, for New Yorkers, I guess Philadelphia was, <laughs> remote and the Phillips they all they all did uh, similar things so. yes you're on mute <laughs> all right there we go um how um, prior to world war ii how um often was it the official policy of con conquering nations uh to loot the uh, the art of their enemies Oh, I think it was very common, uh, uh, but you know, but usually it was just you know you looted a castle or something like that that you conquered. But it was the uh, the French under Napoleon who really started it as a political uh, as as a you know issue, uh, and, and they they I mean they had hired art historian art dealers and whatnot to go with the Napoleonic armies. And they had and they had strict quotas. They were supposed to get twenty from Modena and you know so many from Florence and and stuff like that. Um, and then when the the French they thought their civilization was the best at that time, so they thought that the things should not go back. But of course, um, they had lost. Unfortunately, Napoleon had lost, and his civilization had not. It was no longer exactly the way it had, <laughs> the French Revolution would have it. So um, they, those things were given back, but, the, but not everything. And the French were, were able to hide quite a lot of things. And then during the, after World War I, as a part of the Versailles Treaty, the, there were punitive um, you know, reparations uh, for Germany. And, and that some of that was uh, were works of art. Uh, <clears throat> so it was not a new thing. And well, I mean, somebody like Queen Christina of Sweden uh, you know, had sent, her whole army down, particularly just to get a certain library. I mean, so, but it was usually very limited. Uh, the Nazis really did it on an industrial scale. And it was also very uh, much more genocidal in, in the sense that um, they were gonna take, destroy Slavic, Jewish, uh, uh, all, any, any kind of civilization that was not Aryan. And so that was a whole different, you know, ball game. Thank you. Have you any comments about the movie uh, Monuments Men? Um, well, it's not a very good movie, but it does get the story across. So, yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of the things that didn't happen, you know, the, the Russians and the, I think they have the Russians and the Americans about to attack each other over Alsace, but that, that did not happen. And, uh, um, well, there, and there was, oh, then, then they have, uh, I was sitting uh, watching it with some 
with actually James Rorimer, who was the director of the Metropolitan Museum and his, his children were, and we were watching it at the National Gallery. And uh, in, in the movie, they, the, the lady with the, oh, the, the portrait, the Raphael portrait that I showed you um, is burned up in a fire. So everybody, all the curators started laughing and saying, well, at least now we know where it is. So, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was the, the thought was, was very good. Um, and it was, it was good publicity for the Monuments Men's Program. Lynn, do you mind if I insert a personal note here? Since you knew Jim Rormer and his family, I don't know if you know that his grandson named for him, Jimmy, died a few weeks ago. Oh, Louis, no. uh, yes. He I had, did not know that. Yeah, he had cancer and he did go back to Cleveland so he could be treated at the clinic and it extended his life for a couple of years, but he did die about two months ago, I think it is, four, six weeks. So. Oh, okay, well, I, I will write to them. I did not know that. Oh, he was a, a very charming guy, I mean, young man. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. How long did it take you to gather all this information? Where did you go? And sounds like it was years and years of work. Well, it was. It took me about 10 years. But as I, I said, I started a little bit in Belgium because that's where I found out, you know, what had gone on. And all the Belgian curators, the people, the museum people I knew, they said, oh, well, haven't you heard of so and so and so and so and so and so, and they were all people who were still working. Some of them at the National Gallery of Art, where I had worked before I went to Belgium. And then I came back, and uh, my children were all teenagers and uh, away at school, so I had some time, and um, I spent a lot of time in the National Archives, uh, which down on you know on Pennsylvania Avenue, and really grim time is in the Suitland um, storage area, which is now they've moved, they built this beautiful new archives building in College Park, but that wasn't there then. <laughs> and, uh, but I did also, I, I did research in, very, in Holland and uh, various countries, France, um, and in, in lots of the private papers of the Monuments Men that are in various libraries up and down the coast. So, um, and I, and actually I, I knew a lot of them and they were really fun. My husband got kind of jealous because I would go out with them all the time for lunch. <laughs> and they were pretty attractive, so. <laughs> and actually they, they uh, really, nobody had ever had asked them for a long time what they'd done. So they were, um, you know, they became very enthusiastic about telling their story, which was, I was just going to tell their story, but then I, I realized that I, you know, nobody could understand how, what the fantastic job they'd done, um, unless they knew how much stuff had been taken by the Germans. So, um, so I, then I told that half of the story too. So, <laughs> yeah, it took me a long time, 10 years. I have another question, if I may. Um, how culpable are um, major museums in acquiring uh, looted art, knowingly acquiring looted art, and and how do they how do they hide that fact? Do they knowingly hide that fact if they can? Um, well, I I would say that uh, hardly any of them had knowingly acquired uh, looted mm -hmm. art. However, if, if something is claimed by someone, then they are, um, you know, reluctant to yeah. um, part with it, but uh, for very good reasons that sometimes the claims are not justified. So you really have to take each case on its own merits and, um, you know, find out exactly uh, what happened to it. And um, people who uh, do provenance research, it's called, right. called now, it's, it's a, sort of a whole new field. Um, or it's a, a different kind of a feel. It used to be the thing that art historians did to find out who, you know, who would paint it for to to establish authenticity. But now ownership is has become more important, and so you have to examine all kinds of things: insurance records, um, you know, uh, uh, wills, um, actually personal letters, because then that will say that, oh, dear Aunt Susie, I'm so glad that you finally got the Rembrandt, and so that let you know that Aunt Susie actually did own it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that kind of thing is challenged. So it's, it, there's a lot of technical stuff and paperwork and it does take, sometimes you reach a dead end, you can't find out. So 
But I don't think any of the museums consciously bought looted us. There were a few, a few, there are a few cases, but um, in general, it's just that they, uh, and also people were, by the end of the war, the, the restitution effort went on till 1952. So people were really, they just thought it was done and over with. And I remember when I started this, um, people that were young curators at the Chicago Art Institute, for instance, they didn't even know they'd been looting in World War II. I mean, that was in the 90s. Mm -hmm. No, but it hadn't been 50 years before. So, yeah. you know. Yeah. yeah. And people now, it's hard to convince them that something is looted sometimes. Um, but it's, it, you just have to do it all case by case. But I don't think that the museums all got together to mm -hmm. keep things they should not. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I want to know how did the uh, monument men know where to look for some of these really deeply hidden uh, works of art, and did the locals help tip them off? Uh, yes, they, well, first of all, Rose Vallon. I, I only showed one picture of her, but I have other ones of her in her her uniform and stuff. And uh, <laughs> um, but they they assembled at the Munich collecting point. <clears throat> People came from every nation, and. Um, so Rose Vallon had kept a record, a secret record during the war of where things were being taken. So that was very useful. And um, local people did tell people that, and they interrogated uh, some of the Nazi art people who were, you know, really were art people. I mean, they were not people who wanted to destroy art. They, they had tried to protect it and, you know, do their jobs. And, um, <clears throat> and so, uh, yeah, but it was sometimes it was happenstance, um, but also the all the art people here who were in the army who were had been drafted or volunteered, they knew all these all the art people there. So um, they and and if things had been shipped out of a museum to keep them safe, which is what happened in Germany. I mean, Hitler was very against having anything put into storage because he thought that would be defeatist. So they waited till very late, but the curators all knew where the things had gone. So, the, you know, the James Rorimer could call up his friend in Berlin or, or the, look up the curator, and and they would they knew where they knew where it was. So mm -hmm. but it was uh, you know, but a lot of the places were booby trapped. They had explosives in them. Um, oh. They had built fake walls. I mean, all kinds of things. It's wonderful reading. <laughs> We have two more questions in our chat. Uh, Benita wanted to know if you were aware of the robbery of Iran artifacts from the Carter Presidential Library. And not um, I, I think that was, no, I'm actually not, no. Okay. <laughs> and Dan Lozier, you have a question? <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? Sorry, sorry. On this question of restitution and provenance, uh, the Germans, um, the Nazis were confiscating this art all over Europe from museums and from private collections and from um, other places. And then the stuff that they didn't consider to be uh, of the type that the uh, met with German approval, they would, they would, uh, if it was, they, if they felt there was a market for it, they would have these big auctions, and these auctions were uh, held to, to earn foreign exchange. And I think a lot of those paintings were bought by museums. Where did those museums think that the paintings came from? Mm -hmm. Well, they, there was no secret about what the Nazis were doing, at least uh, before the war started. And the German museums have um, collectively, the, this is the German state museums only because they, we had recognized Germany as a, as a nation or, or the Hitler regime or whatever you wanna call it. And so um, that was the German government. And so the German government was selling these things. And so the German museums after the war all got together, the state museums and said they would not claim items that had been uh, deaccession from the state collections by the state, and so that's they're they're okay. They're considered okay. 
Yes, but the sales of those paintings to non-German, to other museums around yeah. the world, uh, right. Right. They could were be bought sold. at the, they were bought at these auctions. Right. Well, but there were, the, two, there were two, there were some auctions that were like the one that I showed the picture of that was put on in Switzerland by the German state, which consisted of items that were sold by the German state. There were other auctions that were uh, of Jewish collections, particularly in uh, that were forced auctions. And those are not, those are considered loot. And if you have, you know, if you can show that um, your things that you owned or your family owned were, uh, <clears throat> were sold at that, that kind of an auction, that's very good evidence uh, that it's yours. It can be claimed. Mm -hmm. But not but the thing the but, German state, the things that German state deaccession being a recognized state um, are not in that category. But during the Nazi era, when the state had confiscated artworks and and were sold by the state, weren't some of those artworks bought by foreign institutions and foreign individuals? Yes. And then, they couldn't. And be, how, they couldn't. And, they weren't allowed. They weren't allowed to be sold in Germany. They right. could only be bought and, by foreigners. Right, and the Germans did that because they wanted foreign exchange. It had to be paid for in dollars or, or Swiss francs. Right. And but the people who were buying it must have known, or they should have known, that these paintings were not being legitimately offered for sale by the owner. But they were being offered by the German state from its own museum, so that was considered. No, no, the ones that the German that the that the Nazis confiscated from French and other museums, they sold those. No, 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 they did not. No, no, they did not. They did not sell at auction, as far as I know, things from the French museums. Can I just or ask a question about current enforcement? Excuse me. Could I just ask a question about current enforcement? Yeah. Um, I know yeah. that recently, um, both the Getty in LA and the Museum of the Bible here in Washington mm -hmm. were penalized for, uh, I don't know if the word was looting in terms of LA, but the, but the Getty carefully avoided asking certain questions about certain of its acquisitions. And the Museum of the Bible apparently put together a wish list, not the museum itself, but the people associated with the museum. And both were penalized, sanctioned by the IRS or whatever the unit is of our Department of Treasury, together with the State Department, I think. What do you think about such enforcement today? Well, that was very recent if it was the Museum of the Bible. I, yeah. I'm not familiar with that case, um, but. Uh, yes, they have. I mean, uh, our government has become much more um, involved in this sort of thing, um, and there are a lot more rules. But the, during the during World War II, we had very strict treasury Im import rules, and a lot of things were uh, seized by the alien custodian, uh, 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 custodian of alien owned art, and things like that. And very uh, accounts were frozen, and the, the, so in order to prevent illegal trade, but of course it was not entirely successful. But you, you really have to take each, it, it's, this is it really has to be a case by case thing because every way thing, every, each situation is a little bit different. So, um, and well, actually the, the, there are, you know, um, all kinds of uh, issues about w under which law should something be um, tried. I mean, whether, because of say a, a, a German family, they now live in <clears throat> the United States and so it should be under American law or German law or under, and then they lived in Switzerland for a while when they bought the painting there and so it should be under Swiss law or they, somebody in Spain owns it now so it should be under Spanish law so that you get into all these very technical things. Um, and so the, often the merits of the case are not, are, not, uh, are ignored. Maybe you'll write another book. <laughs> oh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and I just want to thank you for this fascinating afternoon. Yeah, all oh, well, of us are going thank to go you for home. Thank asking and me. I've, I have enjoyed it. I, I, all the great questions and things. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And I want to so invite everyone.
to join us next month for our author talk with Bill Halal, speaking on Beyond Knowledge, an age of com technology is driving. Oh, I think I should watch that one. <laughs> <laughs> so that'll be on the 23rd. Okay. You can register on our website. Okay. Well, I'm not a, I live in Georgetown, I hate to say, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> oh, a you can I, talk. I'm one yes, inviting. <laughs> be, our, be our guest, please. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So I, I don't know what to do now. So. <laughs> you, Lynn, Speaking of technology, great. right? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Every you. time you talk, there's something new that comes up. Yeah. Oh, yes. There's That's so true. many things that you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye. Bye.